Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the IRCGN collection. That is the Central Firearms Collection of the French Gendarmerie. They have been uh, gracious enough to give me access today to come in and grab a couple of cool guns to film for you guys. So today we are taking a look at something that is rather difficult to find out there outside of the French military, and that is the AA-52 light machine gun or general purpose machine gun. This was developed as the result of a 1945 program to modernize French military machine guns. So the French had come out of World War II with the Châtellerault 2429 as their light machine gun, and the Hotchkiss 1914 still in service as their heavy machine gun. And both of these were seen as being obsolete at this point, and inadequate. The Hotchkiss was just way too heavy of a gun. Uh, didn't have a high enough rate of fire, the feed strip system was totally obsolete. The Châtellerault was a much better gun, it was really a quite good light machine gun, but the whole light machine gun concept was looking like it was becoming obsolete. People saw the German universal machine gun concept in action in World War II, the MG34 and the MG42, and came to the conclusion that this, this idea of a belt-fed gun that could be fired off a bipod by a one or a two man crew as a light machine gun, or put onto a heavy duty tripod and supplied by a larger crew with interchangeable barrels, and thus serve as a heavy machine gun. People liked that concept, and so the French in 1945 instituted a program to come up with something like that. Now three different organizations would supply, would, would do R&D towards this end. One was the Saint-Étienne uh, factory, one was the Châtellerault factory, and one was uh, AME, or the, the development group in Mulhaus. These were the guys who in particular had uh, some German influence from the old Mauser R&D factory. Well, after a number of years, what came out of these three institutions was out of Saint-Étienne, a gas-operated gun, out of Mulhaus, <laughs> perhaps not surprisingly, essentially a, uh, a modified version of the MG42, and out of Châtellerault, a lever delay blowback gun. Of these different developments, only Châtellerault's design was found to be actually meeting all of the requirements, the criteria, the standards for size and weight and rate of fire and form factor and reliability. And so uh, the Mulhaus and the uh, Saint-Étienne guns were dropped, and Châtellerault's gun was uh, adopted as the AAT-52, uh, or Arme Automatique transformable, transformable. Ideal, the, the idea being it could be a light machine gun on a tripod, or it could be a heavy machine gun mounted up on, or it could be a light machine gun on a bipod, or a heavy machine gun mounted up on a tripod. So also intended for vehicular mounting, they had versions of this with a heavier barrel with no sights and no bipod that could be mounted in, say, a tank. Um, the idea was take that universal machine gun and do it the French way. Now, these guns were manufactured, it were originally designed and adopted in 7.5 by 54 millimeter French, the standard French rifle cartridge. Within just a couple of years of adoption, however, uh, there was a lot of, well obviously the NATO trials for a new standard NATO rifle cartridge were going on, and it became clear 7.62 NATO was going to be adopted as a general purpose cartridge. And so the French started looking into what would be involved in converting uh, the AA-52 into 7.62 NATO. And it didn't look like it would really be that big of a deal. Uh, the cartridges, the ballistics look very similar, and Châtellerault figured, really not a big deal. So uh, we'll talk about that conversion in a minute, but first let's take a look at how this actually works inside. It's a remarkably simple, um, sort of a bomb-proof simple kind of gun. Like I said, there's really not a whole lot going on on the inside of the Model 52. It's a remarkably simple and effective uh, general purpose machine gun. So the receiver is primarily stamping, similar to the MG42. There is a collapsing stock back here. Now you can't actually fire the gun with the stock collapsed because the bolt will hit the stock arms on the inside. However, it is very easy to extend, and this is just done for uh, making the gun smaller for transportation, you just pull it back, and there there is no lock when it's uh, in the retracted position. So you just pop this open. In order to close it, you take that lever, pull it to the side, and you can collapse the stock back in. 
it is a belt fed system, so feeds in on the left, belt, well, links come out on the right, and empty cases eject out the bottom. We have a rear sight up here on the top cover. This whole top cover is very obviously taken from the German MG42. Uh, the, the lever to open it is particularly distinctive. Um, and like the 42, you also then have a feed tray that can be lifted up. Now where this uh, differentiates itself completely from the MG42 is in the bolt operation. So you'll notice when I pull the bolt back, the bolt body comes back, the bolt head stays in place. Like so. That is a non-reciprocating charging handle, and by the way, um, the simplifications put into practice here with the manufacturer of the gun mean that you have to have the bolt back in order to close the top cover. The top cover on the inside is also very MG42-like. We have a large lever here that is going to pivot back and forth as the bolt travels back and forth, which causes our feed poles to cycle here. This pulls the belt in, well, pulls it in that direction. But uh, when the bolt is closed, the system is in this position, and it is spring-loaded such that it will always return to that position. So you have to have the bolt open uh, in order to close it. And that's fine, that's part of the loading process. You have the bolt open, uh, and then you can either open it and put a belt in, or feed a belt through from the side. The gun was designed using essentially the same bipod as the uh, Chatillero 2429. Of course it was designed by the Chatillero Arsenal. Makes sense they would use what they had. This had seemed to work pretty well in service. And we have a quick change barrel. In order to remove the barrel, all I have to do is press this lever down, and then I use the barrel handle to unlock it, and... Uh, there we go. And pull it out, which I'm not quite an expert at doing yet. A little bit like the M60 here, in that your bipods are attached to your barrels, uh, less like the M60 in that there is no gas system being attached to the barrels, because the gun doesn't have a gas system. I do want to point out that with the barrel removed, this whole package is really quite compact with the stock folded. This is super short and easy to transport. So uh, let us continue with some more disassembly. Go ahead and pull the pistol grip off next. There is one pin holding it on here. Just pop that pin out, and the pistol grip comes off. It's a very simple pull-down, drop-sear sort of fire control grip. There you go. Uh, and it has a simple fire and safe lever. There isn't a semi-auto option on here. Next up we can take off the rear stock assembly by unscrewing this pin. There we go. That's threaded into this side of its bracket. Once we have it unscrewed a bit, it will just pull right out. There we go. I do have to pull the stock open, and then it's held in place by this lip at the top, and the recoil spring sets in that little recess. So our stock assembly just comes off. By the way, it does have a shoulder rest that you can lift up recoil spring and guide rod. And then we can pull out this one's a bit sticky inside. But there we go. We can pull out our bolt and carrier. While we're at it, I will point out that if I lift these up, I can take this pin and that comes out, which allows me to take off the feed tray and the top cover. Our bolt assembly is four separate components that come apart. So we have the, the bolt carrier back here, you could call it, or the, the bolt extension. We have the actual bolt head, we have the lever arm, and we have the firing pin. And I can just pull this right off the front. The firing pin comes out. So let me start with this guy. 
this sits in that little hole there, which fixes its length pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty unequivocally, and then it runs into that hole in the top of the bolt head, right there. And the idea is the firing pin will only protrude out the uh, out the breech face when the bolt is fully locked in battery, like this. And as soon as the bolt starts to open, the firing pin is is, you know, has to be pulled out because it's hooked onto the rear piece. So we've got that, and we've got our lever arm here. And this is the critical functioning component of this system. So the idea of lever delayed blowback is when the bolt is locked, so to speak, in battery, it's not actually locked, but when it's fully in battery with a cartridge chambered, this lug is sticking off into the side of the receiver. And you can see that recess right here. So that lug is sitting in there. If we look at the outside of the receiver, you can see that this steel block, uh, which is cut through the stamping there, that is essentially the locking surface. That's separately hardened. There's this pin that's holding it in place down to there so that it can be changed. And that's inserted into the receiver stamping. And you'll notice it's asymmetrical. So uh, on the opposite side is just basically a guide surface. This is the important area. So when uh, the gun fires, pressure is pushing back on the cartridge, and this whole thing wants to move backwards, but this is held in place by the receiver. So instead, we, we can see if we push on this, what's going to happen is it's going to force the rear portion of the bolt, which is most of the mass, to move backward. And only when the rear portion of the bolt has moved this far backward has this arm, this lug, disengaged itself from the receiver. And so it's now at this point that uh, continuing pressure on the whole assembly pushes it all back. And that's when it starts to extract a case. Uh, and then of course the opposite happens when it chambers a new round. Uh, this is, the breech face is going to hit the barrel face. It's going to stop the backside of the bolt is going to continue forward, being pushed by the recoil spring, which pushes this lever arm into position inside the receiver. And what's happening here essentially is this arm is, because it is magnifying, because it is un of unequal lengths, this side is longer than this side. It is magnifying the effective mass of the rear half of the bolt, forcing it to move backwards uh, before the bolt head can move. And that uh, basically gives time for pressure in the, in the barrel to drop uh, so that it can open safely. Um, this was a system developed by a Hungarian designer by the name of uh, Pal Karai, who used it in a couple guns. It was used in a SIG submachine gun in the 1920s. Um, it was used in a 30 caliber carbine, uh, carbine designed actually with Kirai's help in the Dominican Republic in the 1950s, and then the system was used in the AA-52 and later the FAMAS. And that's pretty much all of the lever delay blowback firearms that ever saw significant production. You can see the cuts on the top here that are going to operate uh, in tandem with this lug right here in the top cover to cycle rounds in and out, well, cycle rounds in. The one other important feature on here is this surface right here. That's the sear surface. That is what engages with the fire control group. And when you pull the trigger that drops, which allows this to move forward. Uh, it does reset off of that coming backward uh, to catch the bolt and stop it once you've released the trigger. And there it is, all field stripped, the AA-52. Uh, really a remarkably simple kind of bomb-proof sort of light machine gun. Compact to get around, all the features you'd want, um, and none of the creature comforts that uh, you shouldn't be accustomed to if you're in the army anyway. By 1964 the Chatellerault arsenal had finished its testing and development on converting the AA-52 into 7.62 NATO. It proved to be a little more difficult than everyone thought it would be. There were a number of modifications that were required. Uh, we'll go into all those details in another video when we take a detailed look specifically at the AAF-1, which is what that conversion uh, 
became designated as. Uh, fundamentally, the gun remained the same, just changes to a bunch of details and small parts, new bipod and... Anyway, um, this is an interesting development in that this is during this time that the French were looking at uh, generally standardizing on 7.62 NATO, and as we have a separate video on, came to the conclusion that they just weren't going to for a rifle. But they did for their universal machine gun, which was this, the 52 turned AAF-1. Anyway, um, in AAF-1 guys, these are still in some military service with the French army. So really a pretty long-lasting gun, uh, and a very interesting one. Uh, one of very few examples of lever-delayed blowback. Obviously, after this came out, uh, the FAMAS would go ahead and use that same principle itself to great effect. So, anyway, um, a big thanks to the IRCGN collection for giving me access to come in here and take a look at some of their particularly interesting guns to show to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.